Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Paul. It's good to be here with you at OC Talk Radio. Today's episode is once again with my dear friend Terry Hershey, who is in two days will give a talk on emotional and spiritual immune systems. Now, before Terry told me about his speaking gig, I had never even really considered such a thing as emotional or spiritual immune system. That The thought intrigued me, and so here we are. Um, and But, you know, as I thought about it, it did occur to me, when we take a vaccine, we are actually injecting, being injected with a, a microdose of the disease so that our bodies can build up an immune system. So I wonder, is the same thing true of our emotions and our spirituality? If so, then it must be the case that our emotional or spiritual immune systems are developed in our brains only when we allow a negative emotion to have its way for a while. So um, I'm wondering about that. What do you think there, Terry? Charles, how are you? I am. You know, um, I didn't say, "Yo, Hirsch, what's up?" Yo, Hirsch, what's up? Uh, yeah, I know. So you, <clears throat> we need to work on your immune system. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, you know the old-fashioned word for immune system. That, of course uh, not. We, that we don't use anymore is that pe- we talk about people being grounded. Really. In other words, yeah. In other words, they're in a place. They're in a healthy place. They're established in a healthy place. Yeah, like you say, comfortable in your own skin. Yeah, that that would be another way to say it. Comfortable in your own skin, which is a perfect way. Think think about immunity now. I mean, it's obviously the big deal. It's on every news thing with the coronavirus. It's people telling you, you know, you need to do these sort of things for your own immunity. Well, when you're not doing those things and you're stressed out, you are not comfortable in your own skin. And stress has a lot to do with it, doesn't it? It's stress and fear really really seem to be strong emotions well, st- involved in this. Yes, yeah, stress and fear. But here's the key, I mean, to your point, going back to what you said, that's interesting that you talked about the fact that we, when we get a shot, we get a little bit of the, quote, virus itself. But so stress and st- in and of itself, stress is, is part of life. And in and of itself, fear is sort of a part of life. Well, it and certainly so the was question, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the cave walking man days. No, it says now too, but I mean, the the point is, it, but the question is, it, it is it all that we believe about reality? That's a great question. Words, when, yeah. In other words, when stress when stress wins, in other words, it's all we believe about reality. I'm at a loss for how to respond, and I don't have resources for how to react or respond, and uh, and I don't trust what I can do and or say. And, you know, I feel, I, I literally feel at the mercy of. And so it's no wonder, it's, it's no wonder, you know, I become reactive and I become um, angry and I become exhausted and I become detached and I become disconnected. A lot of things, when I, when I talk about, for example, so let's boil it down to why, I, why I'm doing this subject. That's good because that was my first question. My work is with what I ca- I call them ministries, even though it's not all church stuff. I, I, I work primarily with people who do work of the heart. So I work with healthcare, a, a lot, all healthcare organizations, a variety. I work with educators. So the, both of them, people who get into that business do so because they want to help people. And then I work with churches in a variety of slash uh, uh, the kind of thing that you do in, in, in Uganda, 501c3 kind of stuff. Right. And uh, people who get into all that stuff do so because of something their heart leads them to do it. Okay, that's good. We will be better off. People will be better off. Uh, we as a society will be better off. Great, got it. But here's what I know about all of those places. Anybody who gets in that work, Burnout, it's very difficult for people who get into that to know how to say no or take care of their own personal and, and emotional and spiritual health. And so burnout is huge 
in all of those, shall we call them, industries. There really is, because, because taking a break or backing off is somehow a negation of your effort, of, of your validity in that organization, that you no longer exactly. care about, you, you, you no longer have the heart for the people that you once had the heart for. Yeah, and that's so. Uh, a lot of this, this immunity, this the thing about immunities is, I don't see the. For example, stepping back would be, you know, uh, you know, in, in my list of the three or four or whatever I have here of things, what I would call the shots for immunity. One of them is stepping back, and a lot of the difficult reason is I don't want to step back because somehow it brings into question my own identity. Yeah, and and stepping back is so essential. You know, I I I I I'd, I'd plan to talk about this later, but this is, I I read a quote in in the translator of the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, and and, and the the translator is Derek Lin, and he had a quote that I really liked. He says, "We become what we think, and we really can't think well until we step back, because we are so bombarded." by information, feelings that just that are so distracting that we can't that creates that that thing. I really like what you talked about when you said stress is is immobilizing because y- you you are you are out of options. You are out of places to go to to help you see sanely through your life through your life. I mean, the, the, that's the thing. That now we're going back to being grounded. In other words, when when you're grounded, you have choices. Life doesn't choose for you. If you're in the myriad of whatever's going on, a cacophony around you, but you're not at the mercy of it. When you're in a grounded place, it's just like the people who are. Um, um, uh, what, what's what's the in the war zone, the, 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 the beds, the, the triage people, you right. see them with all that around them. The ones who are in a good, sane place, you see them do their work in the middle of that because they're grounded because they have, there, there has been time where they've taken care of who they are so that when they're in the middle of that, the triage times, they can do what they're there to do. You know, and there's certainly, because, you know, right now I'm currently, I, I'm in a, in a process of reading one entry per day of the of the Tao Te Ching, and it is all about grounding. It is all about putting out the noise and getting to the way, and which is a which is um, it is in a sense. I, I like what you said when you said stepping back. It is a stepping back and evaluating and and consciously deciding how you're going to respond. And, and sometimes, sometimes it is intuitive, so you don't think it's so conscious, but many times, you know, I really do believe in the conscious aspect of our life. But that's why, that's one of the reasons to be intentional about uh, making these choices for immunity. I mean, and stepping back would actually be my first one. I mean, I mean, if we're going to get religious about it, we, we owe it to, I mean, our, our, our Jewish heritage, which is, Sabbath. In other words, that's the first one. The stepping back. That's your first thing. Tell me, tell me where you stop. Because stopping is about replenishing your own capacity. To I like that. Yeah. I, I, to make choices. To have the, to have the wherewithal. You, you know, we, we, we talked um, a few weeks ago. We did an episode as we explored my sequestered retreat with 10 days of total silence, no books or computers or phones, stuck in a small room with a bed, eight square foot area out in front of my cabin. And so for six days, I did nothing but think and explore my emotions, both deep pains and beautiful joys. As we discussed, I faced demons I didn't even know existed. As a result of stepping, because this was a, a stepping back and facing, a stepping back and, and allowing the inner workings of my soul to sort of 
permeate my unconscious and, and slip somewhat into my conscious state. And I'm telling you, Terry, after that, their power, you know, the power of the pain and, and, and the difficulties and all of the negative emotions, their power over my sense of well-being has diminished enormously. In fact, even six weeks after this, my wife claims she still sees a, different, a difference in my attitude, that I'm calmer and less anxious. And that was having faced those, as I'm calling them, demons, having faced the deepest negative emotions that I have and and looked at them through different eyes. I think that was also very helpful. I wholeheartedly agree with that. And the different eyes are that they are, even though I've assumed that they have controlled or been present in much of my life, they are not who I am. And I love the fact that their power is diminished. In other words, I get to say to distraction and or hurry and or the need for perfection and or shame and or victimhood and or anger and or hatred, any of these things that cause chronic stress to my spirit, I can look at them because they are like demons in a way. They're toxic, but I can look at them and say, I'm glad you're here, but that's not who I am. Yeah, you served a purpose. I like to yeah, tell them, that's actually, you, you, yeah. you served a purpose. There was a time when, in my youth, especially when I needed you, but now is the time for me to say, you served your purpose, thank you, but you are no longer needed. You are no longer yeah, needed in I, my conscious state today. Yeah, and, and to your point way back at the beginning, is the, the fact that you can say you served your purpose and you're no longer needed means... It's okay that you welcome there. Just like you said, I took that dose of the small thing, the disease itself, but it didn't, it didn't, uh, it didn't undo me. So that's the small dose where you look at it and says, okay, I see that you're here, but you're no longer needed today. You know, I was told by, by someone I interviewed one time is to look at my childhood I think we've talked, I don't know if you and I have talked about this, but to look at my childhood, not through my child eyes, but through adult eyes, through my eyes today. And I want to tell you, Terry, that perspective was, it was life-changing perspective. It was, it was just an incredible for me to look at them. No longer, no longer am I looking at the pain, but I'm looking at a whole situation. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a a whole, an entire scenario of all the players in the scenario, and I have a very different view of them now. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course it does, because I, I, I get to say now, that's about being grounded. In other words, I, I get to say. One of the keys seems to be found in that oh-so-uncomfortable arena of facing your demons. How can we face our negative emotions in a in a safe place? How can we help people? Do well, that? You, if, uh, first of all, you, I mean, first of all, you you build up your capacity, you build up your strength capacity. I mean, this is a very good sports metaphor. I mean, you have to build that up. You have to work so that I have the the muscles to do that. I mean, that's what. That's what Sabbath rest is. I mean, there are times when I'm doing Sabbath rest and I'm just being driven, or to your point, you know, like the times when you did silent retreats. But in other words, and some people who do that are just driven, you know, batshit crazy because they don't know what to do with it. It's like, oh, I'm going nuts here. In other words, I haven't built up the muscles yet to say, I'm okay with Terry. Yes, you know, and that was like I had a last week I had a guest on and we talked about the boredom and uselessness of retirement and that's because that's a whole paradigmatic shift of always being busy and always being productive and always being useful to where none of those things are required. It called for using new muscles. It didn't happen over a period of a week or two. It was a 
it was a couple of years that it took to really develop that. Yes, and 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 part of that's part of the process. I mean, it's like you know, it's like when any of us go to therapy. You know, I mean, you, know, you go to the therapist because you 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 have all this stuff you wanted to fix. I told my therapist, um, you, you know, you you cost a lot of money, so I know. Uh, uh, I'm hoping you can fix me in, in the first session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before I buy your Mercedes. Well, actually, before I buy your, your, your child's university, but whatever. The point is you're going to get past that. And the irony is that I don't get past those, quote, you call them demons. But I don't get past that, but now they don't own me anymore, so I can sit with them, and they don't, they don't take over. You know that is that is so true, and 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 it's really true in my life. So how can we? I'm sure a listener is asking. So Terry, what do I need to do to be grounded so these negative emotions, this stress, this anxiety, is not owning me? It is not just. It, it you know it hasn't it hasn't possessed. I mean you know I get it where it's not possessing me any longer. Okay, here's my list, and, and I'm not even a list maker, but here's my list. And the first is literally to, to pause, to stop. You have to have moments when you do that. I mean, because the, the thing that's going to drive everybody crazy, think about the way we greet each other every day, no matter who we all are. We all, first, we all say, what, what did you do or what are you doing? In other words, we're asking each other, how are you staying distracted and busy? That is true. Tom, Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton called that, and he's not with us anymore, but Thomas Merton called it uh, uh, a pervasive form of contemporary violence. I love that. He said the rush and pressure, pressure of modern life. Is, go on with that sentence again. He said the rush and pressure of modern life is basically inner violence. No, In other words, we're yeah. carried away by a, we're carried away by a multitude of conflicting concerns. To, we surrender to too many demands. We commit ourselves to too many things, and even in good ways, we want to help everyone around. And in the end, we succumb to our own internal violence. And so, literally, the first thing is, I, I we have to switch the paradigm. Where did you? Where I mean, and you get this because you changed your life this way too. Where did you pause this week? Where did you stop this week? Where did you breathe this week? Yeah, I do it regularly in the mornings and then sometimes in the evenings. But yeah, and I was going to say religious. I was going to say religiously. Then that same thing. Yeah. Yeah, they are my rituals. Yeah, but um, um, but I'm finding myself so even not... pausing more. Usually, I jump right into meditation. Now I'm sitting and thinking for 15 minutes before I even meditate. Yeah. It's just there is so a that, pause. That, there's, there's something inside of me that is causing me to pause and to pause and ponder my P squared. Yeah, and my and because a lot of people say, okay, that's a great person, but while I'm pausing, what should I do? <laughs> I said, <laughs> this isn't a, it's not a contest. It's not a race. I just want you to make space. Yeah. So, and the making, so, so which, which leads, yeah, which leads to number two, and number two is you pay attention. In other words, now you pay attention to what is there in front of you. And someone says, well, it's just a lot of crap. Okay, well, I'll look at it now. It doesn't scare me. I'll look at it. Well, now I see stuff that I wouldn't have seen. There really is something about paying attention, and it is a, it's a... It's a very conscious choice. It is something that that you must it, because it's because paying attention, oddly enough, I think is has become an unnatural act. Um, unless That's, there's yeah. unless there's something spectacular going on, but in the normal everyday, we don't pay attention to what is going on. I don't know if I did it in the last Sabbath moment. I'm doing it coming up, but. Rodan, the artist, Rilke, 
they were friends. And Ro- so Roque said to Rodan, you know, I want to, uh, you know, I want to learn how to, um, how to, you know, be as intentional as you are in life. And he said, okay, go to the zoo and sit by, there's a tiger, a special tiger. They'll let me do. So I just want you to sit in front of the tiger, tiger cage and do what? I want you to look at it for how long? And Rodan said, look at it until you see it. Yeah. And then he wrote the great poem. And then he, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And then he wrote the great poem about the tiger. Yeah, who's in the cage? You are the tiger. Yeah. That's what, that came out of that. That came out of the second one, which is pay attention. In other yeah. words, I don't, I don't run from it anymore. There's a nuance to paying attention that is not just paying attention to the physical things that are going on, as I'm looking over here at Paul, bewildered, wondering what the hell is going on. Um, uh, <laughs> and... and there is a there is a internal paying attention that you're paying attention to what is being said inside of you, what your emotions are, what your thoughts are, you know how you're thinking of yourself, how you're thinking of others. There's a paying attention to those internal voices that rather than letting them dominate sort of um, incoherently, taking them one by one and looking at them and and dismantling them and understanding them. This is a good point because paying attention there is, 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 I mean, this is my favorite metaphor or image for this is Bruce Lee. Remember the Bruce Lee movies? Yeah. And even what Bruce Lee could do in life. Remember when they slowed everything down and he saw all the little things all around him that were about to happen. Yeah. I, I vaguely remember that. But none of it undid him. Some of it could have been really, really bad. But none of it undid him. Because he saw it slowly and he could respond. Exactly, because he had the capacity to respond. Because he was grounded. He was in a place where he was comfortable with him, his capacity. You know, I think that's a metaphor for what I'm talking about, our emotions. Is that rather than let us, us rather than allow a host of emotions to bombard us at one time. And we, that's when, that's when the stress occurs is when there's so many different things hitting us at one time is that we sort of single them out or, or identify them individually and we can deal with it so much, so much better that way rather than the incoherence of garbled thought. Now we're back at the paying attention thing is, you know, cause I can come in. At, we've all had this where someone has come to us and say, it's overwhelming. I don't know what to do. It's crazy. I'm nuts. I'm driving it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What can I do? And you say, okay, breathe. And they say, yeah, that's not helping. I'm still nuts, et cetera. And you know what it's like at some time when you've been able to just breathe and there's space and you look at it and you say, oh, okay, that's not good that I can handle the not good thing now. Or you can say, oh, that was nothing. Why did that get so much attention? And you can go through them. But it is, back to what I said earlier, it's a conscious choice. You make a choice is, to do that. It is a conscious choice. It is a conscious choice. And 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 because some people say, well, it's easy for you to say or do, and as if it's a skill set that certain people learn, what people need to understand is everyone has the capacity to make that conscious choice, to make those choices. This isn't a race. This isn't a contest. This isn't a beauty pageant. Okay, so, round, yeah. so so let's go through our steps here. So the first one is, is I'm not sure if the first one is or not, step back. Is that step back, step back. pause? Step back. Step back. And is the second one pause? Well, pause is step back. Pause is, is step back. So that's Sabbath. Yeah. That's yeah, exactly Sabbath. Step back. Pause. Do nothing. Rest. Um, tell me, tell me where that is in your life and your day, because I can tell you right now, and you would you would say this true too. If someone has is overly stressed, I would say if you don't have that place in your life, there's nothing else I can do to help you. Yeah, except advice, offer, advice, except, advice, except advice offer wise. you a fifth of whiskey. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because that's what it is. It's numbing. 
It's it's numbing yeah, exactly. that it's numbing that away. Look, I'm I'm that gonna throw mine. before we take a break. I'm gonna throw I'm gonna throw an idea at you, and and I have no idea. Well, I have a little idea that I think it's a there's some truth to it, but I wonder what you think. And this this goes back to that Derek Lynn quote that I said earlier: "We become what we think." And I read as I was googling this spiritual and emotional immunization, I read one article that says we tend to live in a think, then feel, then act cycle, which means we are acting out on our feelings, not on our conscious and often more rational thoughts. And the author suggested, what if we reverse that pattern and begin with feeling then thinking, then acting. I sort of like the idea of feeling the feeling and then pondering the meaning or consequence of that feeling in a thinking process rather than beginning with thought, beginning with feeling. What Does that strike any accordance with you? I don't disagree with that. I mean, the, 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 the feelings that I have are... Are, are literally there, and it's and it's okay to name them and not be overwhelmed by them. In other words, I get to choose now to name what power they have or what choices I make with them. For example, let's say my feeling is I'm completely unnerved and undone by what's going on, and my feelings are I'm very pissed off. Okay, good. See, but as a grounded person, I can step back, remember, pause, I can step back, take a look at those feelings, and now I get to go to number two, which is, so what am I going to do about it? Now that's your thinking part. What choices can I, am I going to make with those feelings, or am I going to simply let them make the choice? You know, that is so you good. Are, you, you are not at the mercy. People say, well, I was so angry, I'm at the mercy of it. No, you are not at the mercy of your anger. You are not. I mean, I say that as if I haven't been. <laughs> I'm not saying yeah. I practice what I preach. But the point is, at some point, I have had times in my life where I've just said, okay, Terry, practice number one, step back, pause. When you're in doubt, pause. When you're angry, pause. When you're frustrated, pause. Any of those things so that you can do what you said. This feeling is not completely who you are. It's going on in your life, True. Yeah, and it's very dominating in your life. And Yeah, and, and, and the and, point is, with the anger, I can actually take some of the anger without throwing it all away and do something good with it. Well, that's the thought part. That was what I, I came to the conclusion. That was one of the things that really arose, one of the elements that really, the demons that really arose in my, in my um, sabbatical. And that was unrecognized anger and i realized for me at that point now I'm, I'm sure it's much more complex than this but in my handwritten journal i said i really have two choices when it comes to anger i have revenge which only leads to exacerbated anger and bad situations you know negative negative results or i have Believe it or not, I have the option to love my way through it, to forgive and love my way through that anger. And yeah. it is a much saner choice. It is a much more difficult choice. But after you, th- after you pause, after I found that I paused, pondered it, it was the only logical choice. There was no other logical choice. Because I've seen the results of me responding with anger. And I can't recall a single time it's worked. Yeah, and and I, and loving your way through it is I, I like I like I like the language there because I'm not I'm not discounting it, throwing it away, pretending it doesn't exist. No, no. In other words, all I'm saying is this thing about being grounded is you realize that our power is stronger than what you feel at the mercy of. Yes, and. And, 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 and those powers come from within. For those which we're going to go into right, right now, there are spiritual powers that we can, that we can, um, that we can align with. And Correct. And I want to talk about that after a quick break. Hi, 
Hi there, this is Charlie Hedges, and you're listening to The Next Chapter with Charlie, and I'm on with my good friend Terry Hershey, and we are talking about emotional and spiritual immunizations or immune systems. And what we can do, and we've, we've spent about a half an hour or so talking about emotional emotional immune systems and how emotions are so strong in governing our behavior and Terry so wisely suggested that we, when we are inundated with these emotions, that we pause and that we ponder them and we think about what causes them, what is it making us do, what is our correct response. Now, we're going to go to the other side of this, which is the more difficult side to me, and that's the spiritual immune system. And so... Before we begin, Terry, I'm going to ask you the most difficult question I've probably ever asked you. How would you describe spirituality? Spirituality? Yeah. I am flesh and blood, but I believe that I am more than flesh and blood. I believe that all of us are more than flesh and blood. Okay. And if you want, there's a bigger reality to what's going on with that. And so there's something about being human that's more than simply that. Religions have named it in many ways, you know. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah, they've named named the source that we're created by or the source that we're linked to, and that's all fine and well and good. Uh, There's something underneath all of that that is bigger and ties all of, and then I would argue ties all of this together. And, you know, some people can simply say, well, that would be love. And that's fine. I'll go with you on that argument. I argue that it's grace. And spirituality, um, spirituality means that I honor that part of what makes up Terry underneath and bigger than just the flesh and blood. I like that. I think that's a really good definition. I've been listening to Tuning into the Mystics with James Finley, who is part of Richard oh, Rohr's. Well, yeah. Are, are yeah, you familiar he's, with he's Finley? A, yeah, he's a Jungian. He's definitely a Jungian. And what he talks about in Mystic, because he talks a lot about mysticism, he's, the, he's sort of the campus mystic. I've always had this idea that mysticism is a feeling of the presence of, uh, the presence of, God, or ever how we want to use that phrase, um, I'm reluctant to use that phrase because he gets so boxed up in that phrase, but that I've looked at it in the transcendent, that it's in the, in the out there somewhere that I can't even define, that's, that's so mystically out there. And yet James Finley talks about the mystics see the presence of spirituality in everyday, ordinary things. See, so this brings us back, Charlie. That's a powerful thing. This brings us back to step number two. What did we say? Pay attention. And John Duns Scotus, who was, would have been a mystic right. too, right? he coined a phrase called thisness, T-H-I-S-N-E-S-S, thisness. In other words, that's actually the, the sacred in the middle of the very ordinary, thisness. And that's the paying attention part. That's the remarkable thing about that. When I see something bigger than just flesh and blood in the middle of what feels like crazy and the stepping back, the paying attention is I'm invited to an extraordinary world, an extraordinary place. That's, and I see that, this, that, is, that, is, that is constructed of the ordinary. Correct. Absolutely. That's, um, that, is, that, is a, that was a profound thing for me because I... You know, all these years that I've that I've honored mysticism, I've I've really and I've you know I've read the the early church fathers, and I just did not catch that point that it is in the the thisness of it of of the everydayness that that is where we find our spirituality. We find our spirituality in other people and in our daily activities and in the surroundings that we have. And we find divinity, Finley is really strong, we find a, a divinity 
in other people and in nature. They're very strong into nature. That we yeah yeah well, be, the the sacred is in the exquisite and extraordinary ordinary. I'm not just making breakfast. There's something about the smell of the egg that's being cracked and the way it fries, and the popping of the oil. But the way the sun comes through the window and the way it hits me, and the warmth on my skin. There are so many wonderfully extraordinary ordinary things that happen there, that can escape me. If I haven't done number one, pause, and number two, pay attention. And because you're just so distracted with exactly because I have to with the activity, and then you've got to get on to something else. Yeah. So there's two things distracting you. My yeah, my third point is gratitude. In other words, I after I do one and two, I say thank you. I'm glad to be here. You got to that point when you did your silent retreat. You finally got to a place where you said thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you for reminding me that because I was I was saying gratitude is a hard thing for me. Oh, it's hard. Yeah, it's hard for many of us. Is it? You know, I don't yeah. because I don't. I think of my issues and it's difficult for me to be grateful. And that's and I know people that are indeed I, grateful the, people and they're yeah, wonderful the people. The competitor in me almost kicked up and said. Yeah, of, co- of course I'm more grateful than you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my scorecard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my scorecard. My Isn't scorecard's that... better than yours. Yeah, I know. Well, our capacity to be grateful, that's back to the ordinary, the extraordinary ordinary. To be grateful for very small things. I'm going to go out on a limb here, but that's that's not quite unusual, and I want to take take a stab at... I googled, I made the mistake, but I googled spiritual immunizations. Okay. <laughs> and and so, believe it or not, there's quite a host of spiritual oh, I'm sure. immunizations yeah. of how you can immunize yourself spiritually. And um, one site offered a sermon on the 10 keys to spiritual immunization immunization and to me it sounded more like the 10 ways to ensure you're a fundamentalist i just it just did not yeah yeah that's like <laughs> part of that is like um, is like when you're when you grow up in a winter climate like i did and if your mother's cold she ends up putting like seven coats on you in the winter when you go to school in other words, it has nothing to do with your life. And that's the kind of immunization that fundamentalist Christian did to me. You ended up wearing seven coats you didn't need to wear to impress But then, But mother. then you, you didn't dare take any off. Which... Exactly. You didn't take any off because that you'd make somebody mad. But think about that for a minute. When immunization becomes a performance mechanism that you're keeping score about, then you haven't done number one, pause. You haven't done number two, pay attention. And you haven't done number three, gratitude, which leads to number four. And number four is, if you do number one, two, and three, then you realize you've got stuff in your life to give away to people around you who can do the first two. And that's kindness. That's number four. Give it away. Be kind. You know, it's so funny you would say that because um, in, my, in my list, you know, you can imagine my list from Google, yeah. my, my fundamentalist oh. list. <laughs> I can read, imagine the list, yeah. Read the Bible, go to church, have read a Bible, Bible study, church, memorize yeah. scripture, Bible, pray, yeah. give, right. and, you know, just just all the rest. Now, personally, I happen to agree with many of these things, like especially like reading the Bible, but it's not, you know, I don't have, I, I don't have a contest with myself. I don't have a, I don't have a, a list of how many pages I'm going to read each day and what I'm going to accomplish. I just, you know, I could read an entire paragraph or two or a page, or I could read two or three sentences. It's all what strikes me is what's important. But um, you know what? Of this list, in every one of these lists I did, there was something so obviously missing that it was it was really heartbreaking terry to tell you the truth and you know what was missing love forgiveness compassion mm-hmm. 
and kindness. How can you be spiritually immunized without love, forgiveness, compassion, and kindness? How is yeah, it possible? What's interesting is we do that when we're wearing those seven coats to not be cold. Is because we don't trust our capacity. That's the whole thing about not trusting our capacity. When I was trained in that kind of religious upbringing, I didn't trust Terry. I didn't trust Terry to pause and step back. I didn't trust Terry to pay attention and be grateful for the sacred in the very, very ordinary. I didn't trust that because I was told that wasn't enough because my identity didn't come from that. You know, it's even more terror telling in that environment. You know what else he didn't trust? Mm. He didn't trust God. No, <laughs> yeah, well, that would be true. Yeah, really, God I mean, is. because God supplies that. I mean, that is what that is what you know. If you're a Bible reader, that is what the Bible promises. You know, the 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 Gospel of Saint John is just filled with that. Yeah, I, well, yeah, I didn't trust. That is absolutely true. And I, because, well, God's no different than an alcoholic father in that environment. Right. Yes. And yeah, he's just a pissed off old man. Yeah. Instead of, instead of as the, as I've been, you know, listening to these podcasts with James Finley, instead of just this, you, you know, massive pure love and divine goodness that is seeking out what we, what we need to be sought out. Yeah, I I think, to me, you know, yours is grace, mine is love, and I think love is the immunization for all life, spiritual and emotional. Um, and in my mind, all these do is steep us in, you know, these, these other things steep us into a preconceived by human weekly to-do list that actually prevent the pondering of the wondering, wonder and essence of God. They actually, get in, they actually get in the way. The very thing that they're trying to do and that claims closeness with God gets in the way of closeness with God. Yeah, and that's why I like that Merton called it contemporary violence. It literally was violent to your spirit. Well, you know, usually I like to close on a high note, but I think that's a good way to close. I think violence to your spirit and and focusing on grace and love instead. I like your four things and see if I can remember them. To pause, to wait a minute now, to pause, to to I know there's gratitude. And I know there's paying attention. Pause. Pay attention. I th- I missed the third one. No, you did. Third one's gratitude. Pay attention. Say thank you. I mean, that's what. Oh, that's it. There's the just four, three. Four, four, oh, yeah, I thought no, there the were. the fourth one was the fourth one was then then give it away. Tell, oh yeah. yeah, and that share is share it with somebody else. Yep, yep. Share it. There is nothing. There is nothing like you know the. The cup that can never be filled, the love cup that can never be filled, no matter how much you give it away. Look what Rilke did. Rilke paused, paid attention to the tiger, to thank you with the gratitude and wrote a poem, and guess what? Shared the poem with all of us. Here we are yeah. today. And then Trent Reznor wrote a song on it. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Really? Yeah, yeah, he I'm really wrote a song on it. Who do you belong to? Where do you belong? See the tiger in the cage? Do you ever oh, think that could it. be you? Yeah. There it is. That's the one. So then, see, it keeps spilling. That's the whole great news. Yeah. Hey, man, I want to thank you for coming on the show and spending time with me, and um, uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, where and when is the talk, Terry? People might want to... But it's going to be after this podcast. Oh, it's, yeah. So there's no worries with that, because the podcast will be after the talk. So Yeah. But, but yes, I'll be down in Southern Cal. Yeah. And I want to encourage everybody to check out your um, your inspirational post, Sabbath Moment. can be found at uh, terryhershey.com. Thank all our listeners for tuning in to the next chapter with Charlie in this, uh, once again, also strange podcast. And be sure to check us out at our website, thenextchapter.life. Until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now. Mm-hmm.